All right, so um, good afternoon. Again, my name in my language is Ala. Um, in English, it means stranger. Now, not every Inuktitut name that you hear will translate into something in English. Um, I just happened to take on a nickname that was given to me um, and actually changed it into my legal name. So not, not every name is going to turn out that way. So today, um, I'm going to be talking about life up north, um, life up north in the past, life up north today, um, how things have changed. So knew it were what you call nomads. We didn't live in permanent locations. We lived in small family groups and as a family group we moved wherever we lived to wherever the best hunting was, wherever the best fishing was. We were constantly having to change where we lived in order to hunt and survive. We couldn't stay in one permanent spot um, so we lived in igloos igloos are houses made out of snow um, what most people don't know about igloos is you can't just build them anywhere and out of any snow it has to be a particular type of snow and you have to watch where you build that igloo um, because of snow drifts and, and wind um, and, and so you have to pick out your spots. And they weren't just one dome buildings. You could build multiple igloos next to each other, and then you could attach them with tunnels um, so that you could have like a three, four room igloo, um, a place to do your cooking, a place to hang out, a place to sleep. Um, and, and so... Yeah, it's got to be hard, compact snow, um, but if there's ice streaks going through your snow, then that's no good for the igloo. Um, and we actually build a tunnel that goes down and then up um, so that wind doesn't come directly through the igloo. You have to leave a hole on top so that air circulates throughout the igloo, um, replenishing your oxygen. Um, and snow is a natural insulator. There's lots of air in snow. Um, and so when it's like minus 55 degrees outside and the wind is just howling, um, being inside an igloo is quite warm. Now, we had kudliks, which are stone oil lamps, um, as our little fire. And, and how can you have a fire inside of an igloo? Well, it's so cold outside that the fire, the inside part of the igloo melts. But because it's so cold outside, it refreezes right away, making it actually a very, very strong structure um, to live in. Now, during times of summer, when we didn't have snow um, on the ground, we had tents that were made with animal bones and, and animal skin sewn together on the outside. And in places where we would go often and stay a little bit longer, then we could build something called a sod house. Um, you built it using the ground and what you had around you. So you could build up a short wall with, with rocks um, and then you could compact dirt and stuff into the holes of the rocks and then we used whale bones as trusses and then we grabbed sod right from the tundra and put that over top basically like a man-made cave um, out in the middle of the tundra um, and we call those are called sod houses um, and they're built just using what you have around you um, everything that Inuit owned came from the land, uh, came from the animals that we hunted and we ate. So Inuit in the past lived by something called the eight IQ principles. Um, and it was like stewardship to the land, stewardship to the animals, um, working together for a common goal um, through consensus. 
um, taking care of each other, taking care of what we had available to us. So, again, they're called the eight IQ principles. Um, and, and it's basically like just a... Um, just a list of ways to live a nice, cohesive lifestyle together um, and ensuring that everyone around us survives and that everyone for generations to come survives. If we overhunt the caribou, then our grandchildren's grandchildren aren't going to have those caribou um, to enjoy. So we're, we're constantly counting the number of animals that are up north and ensuring that we don't over hunt them, um, therefore leaving country food for generations to come. Um, and yeah, we were a hunting society. We went out um, onto the sea ice and hunted seals. Uh, when the sea ice melted, we were out on the ocean hunting whales, um, in Labrador hunting dolphin, hunting porpoise, um, hunting seals, um, and, and life was lived out on the land. You were basically camping your entire life, trying to survive in the tundra. Um, and when you're out on the tundra uh, hunting, not only are you hunting, but you are being hunted as well. Um, so it's a very, very beautiful place to be. I've had the pleasure of visiting four different communities up north, um, three of them being in Labrador and one of them being in northern Quebec. Um, and it's, it's the most beautiful place that I've ever visited um, being up in the Arctic. Um, but it's also, it can get quite scary. Um, when you're out for a walk, you have to be vigilant um, and you have to be watching around you because polar bears now are coming into town, into the dumps um, for easy food. They're coming into town more often. Um, so living life as a nomad out on the tundra, um, you always had to be vigilant of what was around you, what weather is coming in. Um, you always had to make sure that your group, your family was protected from the elements and, and from the creatures that live up north. Um, so all of our clothes came from animals for instance the seal skin behind me um it could be turned into mitts or boots um seal skin is naturally waterproof um so that's why we'd use it for our mitts and and our boots um another thing we could take the fur off de-hair the hide um and then that could be sewn around some whale bones that were tied together in the shape of a kayak um, Inuit invented a seafaring boat using absolutely nothing but animal parts. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and, and yeah, everything was done together for a common purpose to ensure that everybody survived. It wasn't about the individual. It was about the group, and and more likely than not, the group that you were living with was your family. Um, Inuit in Canada, we have nine different dialects or nine different ways of speaking the same language, uh, kind of like how Canadian English is different to Australian English, which is different to England English. Right or like Quebec French is different to France French. So Inuit have nine different dialects um, just in Canada alone. And again, we live all across the circumpolar region in Siberia, in Greenland, in Alaska. Um, so there's many, many different dialects. And I have never heard of any Nuktituk word for please. It just didn't exist in our language. I mean, when you live in a small family group, you know when somebody is living without. So rather than waiting for them to ask um, for what they need, it was freely offered to them. So we have no word for please, but we have over 20 words 
for thank you. Um, and I think that's just a beautiful culture where, where that one word doesn't exist, but there are so many other words for thank you to show gratitude. So where I come from in Labrador, um, the word for thank you is nakumik in Baffin Island. Um, it's kuyangnamik. And uh, in the Western Arctic, they say matna. Um, those are the three ways that I know how to say thank you. Um, we also existed in a world without money, without electronics, um, and it wasn't that far back in our past. Sorry, my dog's whining. Um, it wasn't that far back in the past that we were living this way. Inuit have gone from igloos to iPods um, in one generation. So my children's grandmother was actually born on the land um she was she was born in an igloo she was raised in a nomadic lifestyle um she was in a pre-arranged marriage um and now she's on facebook right so in technology the switch from from the old way to the new way um, happened pretty fast for, for Inuit. Um, so now today, life up north looks much different than it did in the past. Um, the, the Canadian government forced us to live in permanent locations, um, in, in permanent like cities, villages, what have you, what name you. Um, and that transition happened really fast and it was really, really tough on a lot of Inuit. We were used to following the animals that we hunted. We were used to f moving around and now all of a sudden we were forced to live in one single spot um, across the Arctic, 53 different communities. So we had to relearn a lot of our traditional knowledge. Um, it had change. So now instead of following the animals that we hunted, we now had to wait for the animals to come to us, um, which was a tough thing to do when for thousands and thousands of years, you're used to following the animals. Um, now we had to wait for them to come to us. Um, and with the change, um, new religions were brought over, new religions were forced upon us, um, and the old ways of, of shamanism and living off the land um, were taught to us as being evil um, and poor, right? It was now about money and about riches um, instead of living off of the land and trying to help each other. Um, so now houses up north, um, we have houses just like there are houses down here, except not that many basements. I think in Iqaluit there may be basements, in Iqaluit there's big buildings, but in like the smaller communities, um, all of our houses are built on stilts, so they're built above ground. Um, and that's just due to the permafrost. Uh, we don't want to be digging holes in the permafrost and then trying to keep that basement um, from the freeze and the thaw and the freeze and the thaw and then trying to heat up um, that much square footage. So most houses up north are just bungalows built above ground, no second floor. Um, and it's very hard to build new houses up north. So we have housing shortages across practically all 53 of our communities. Um, here we live close to forests, we live close to um, construction material, um, and if we need some ship from somewhere else, well, there are roads that connect um, the south together. So those things could be transported by truck um, pretty easily. Um, to wherever you're, you're building. But up north, 53 communities fly in only. So all of the material to build a house has to go up by plane if possible, um, or it has to wait till the summertime and, and go up by, by boat. Um, so imagine you're building a house um, and you're framing in the house and all of a sudden you're a sheet of plywood short. 
Um, well, you have to wait until like the following summer for your your plywood to make it up um, by boat. So any anything that's short, anything that's missing, um, causes long delays in in building those houses. So up north, you could have like today like a four bedroom house. And there may be like 15 to 20 people um, who are living in that house. You have your extended family come and stay with you um, simply because there's just no other room for them to go. It also keeps the cost of living somewhat down. Um, everybody can kind of pitch in for food. Somebody can go and hunt. Um, for instance, in Greece Fjord, a watermelon is $68. So they cut it in half, they cut it in half again, and they sell each quarter for $17. Um, so f living with your extended family, with other people in your house, kind of helps to keep that cost of, of living down um, and, and helps in, in different ways. Uh, but it's also hard when you live in such a small house um, with so many people, um, it can get very aggravating. I mean, you have no privacy. Um, so, so it's tough. And then our, our communities are really small. So there aren't that many communities with paved roads. Um, we do have cars up north that get brought up by boat. Um, we have ATVs and snowmobiles in the wintertime. Um, there's bicycles for the kids and adults to ride. Um, but most of the roads are dirt in the summertime, lots of potholes. Um, and I mean, there's all mixed vehicles out on the road. So people don't drive very fast. It's hard to get up to speed in, in a lot of communities just because of the conditions of the roads. And I mean, there's no sidewalks. So Inuit are walking on the road too. Um, and in most communities, there may be like one grocery store, uh, one corner store, and one restaurant, which is usually in the one hotel. Um, and, and so there's not a lot of like you can't choose to go to Esso or choose to go to um, a, a different gas station because there's only one, right? Um, not a lot of fast food restaurants up north. Um, so if you're tired and you don't feel like cooking for your family, um, there's, there's not really much that you can order in. Um, so you've got to get up. You've got to go and cook. Uh, we have schools. Most communities now have an elementary and a high school, um, which only happened in like the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, I guess that every community has now got a school. Um, but the curriculum is kind of backdated from the compared to the south. So when our youth move from the north down to the south, um, they struggle in that transition. Um, in school up north, um, from kindergarten until grade three, um, all instruction is in Inuktitut. Um, and then English starts in grade four. So if, if a young child moves from the north down to the south, that makes it an even harder transition in going to a school down here. And a lot of schools in the south, they actually have more students in the schools than some of these communities have people. Um, so imagine living in a community of, of 500 people and now all of a sudden every day you go to school where there's 700 students. Um, it can get overwhelming. It can get kind of um, very noisy. That's one thing I noticed. I spent 12 days one summer in Labrador. Um, and on the way up, we stopped in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and our layover ended up turning into a 12-hour layover. Um, and it was fine. We sat in the terminal. Um, there was bad weather um, further north, so uh, there was fog, which is very dangerous to, to fly in. So our small little layover ended up turning into quite a long one, but uh, I had music, so I was, I was all right. 
Um, and we finally made it to our destination. Um, and then I spent 12 days in three different communities in Labrador. And I noticed on the way back, um, I had a small layover again in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. And I went outside to, to get some fresh air. And there was just this overwhelming noise. There was noise everywhere. Um, and I turned to my friend who I traveled with and I said, like, this noise, it's deafening. I'm, I'm not used to this anymore. Um, the airport in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, was doing some renovations to their roads on, on the outside. Um, and my friend, she's like, well, did you not notice the construction on the way up to Labrador? And, and I said, you know what? I had no clue that, that it was here because I was used to living in Ottawa where, again, there's constant noise. So the construction noise didn't bother me on the way up, even with a 12-hour layover. Um, but on the way back down, that noise was just deafening. Um, so it's really neat. In, in Ottawa, um, I have like ADHD. I can't sit still for a very long time. I always have to keep moving. But in Labrador, um, with the quietness, the stillness, um, I found myself like just sitting on a rock by the, by the water um, for two, three hours at a time um, in just stillness and peacefulness. Um, and, and that ADHD wasn't really affecting me as much um, when I was up in Labrador. So life up north, it's, it's harsh. It's hard. Um, it's, it's a very tough place to survive. But it's like the most beautiful, beautiful place that I have ever visited. I've been to Germany. I've been to Austria. I've been to Holland. Um, I've been to England um, for hockey. I traveled all across um, Ontario. I did trucking for six months and drove all across the United States. Um, and absolutely nothing compares to the north. Um, I, I got to travel once to Kujuak in northern Quebec for a week. I volunteered for a, a science program to help run camp up there for the youth. Um, and one day I took a walk up the hill, um, up to Radar Hill. And what's really neat about Kujuak is it's built along the tree line. Um, so I got up to Radar Hill and I looked south. Um, and, and I could see forest, I could see trees. Um, and, and then I turned around and looked north and, and all you could see is, as far as the eye could see was, was tundra. Um, and it was quite awe-inspiring to be up on that hill um, and, and see both worlds. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I, but again, it's, it's dangerous. So if you ever travel up north and you want to go for a walk outside of the community, make sure you talk to some locals, um, see if there have been polar bears spotted or, or anything, um, and just like make sure that you're safe. You're in a brand new environment. So it's always good to, to talk to the locals and find out which is the best route to go for a walk. Um, or, or like make a friend and ask if they want to walk with you. Um, cause yeah, it can get very, very dangerous up North real fast. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what else I could talk about. Um, I know next week I'm going to talk about more of the, the struggles, um, and the hardships that, that Inuit have been put through. Um, and then the week after that, Inuit, we always like to end on a, on a positive note. Um, so the last Wednesday in October, um, I will be teaching some Inuit games that you can play with um, some social distancing um, or even Inuit games that you can play with just your your bubble um so like make sure those partner games you only play them with other family members that you live with full time uh, we want to be covid safe um especially now that we're hitting phase two 
um, here in Ottawa and Ontario. Um, so, I mean, make sure you tune in, uh, that you're dressed to play some, some pretty physical games um, and, and you're ready to have a lot of fun for that one. Um, and I'll ask my son, um, who's 15, to join me for that one and to help teach games. Um, so yeah, just to recap, Inuit up north in northern Canada, we have 53 different communities. They all fly in. The smallest one is Grease Fjord, between 200, 250 people. Um, the largest one is Ichaluit. Um, there's over 10,000 people who live there. Um, in my part of the world, in Labrador, where I come from, the largest community is Nain. Um, 1,200 people live there. And Nain was actually founded by the Moravian missionaries um, in like 17... 67, 1777, somewhere around there. Um, so Nain's been around for um, a really, really long time. Um, and yeah, I mean, food prices expensive, shipping prices expensive. For an individual to fly from Ottawa to Ichaluit and return um, is $3,000. So it's a very tough place to go and, and visit. But if you ever get the chance, um, I would jump on it right away. Again, it's the most beautiful place I've ever seen um, anywhere I've ever traveled. Um, and yeah, try out some of the, the local cuisine, some nice dried fish, um, some frozen seal is pretty good when I mean, you can cook it um if you absolutely need to but in the traditional sense um inuit ate it frozen dried um or or, or cooked right uh, smoked too lots of smoked fish up north absolutely delicious um if you go up in the summertime there's some berries that you can pick there's like a blackberry a blueberry there's even an orange berry kind of looks like a, a raspberry except the bumps are bigger uh, it goes by several different names in, in english like the cloudberry or the bake apple um in inuktitut we call it an akpik um and in kujuak in in the summertime they host a, an akpik jam which is like a music festival that's right around the time of of akpik picking um, so it's a pretty cool play on words. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys um, had fun listening to me today and that you learned uh, a, a few different things. And uh, again, tune in next week uh, when I get into some of the, the harder realities of, of living as an in Inuit in Canada. And then definitely, definitely tune in last Wednesday in October um, and learn some traditional Inuit games. So stay safe, everyone, um, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much for tuning in.